Uh, Bill Fenton, who was a distinguished uh, Iroquoianist, passed away a few years ago, uh, told me a story once about being in the Museum of the American Indian in the 1930s when he was a young graduate student. And he got into a conversation with Mr. High and explained that he was studying Iroquois history and culture and he was a graduate student and he anticipated a career in this field. And he said, High looked at him and said, go to Wall Street, make money, and then you could become an anthropologist. <laughs> now, I want to just use that story to illustrate how High is frequently remembered by academic smart Alex like me uh, as kind of a joke, uh, a person about whom there are a lot of funny stories. And our next speaker, I think, is someone who has taught us a great deal, taught me a great deal, and I think others over the past several years, as she has taken High seriously as an intellectual and as a collector, uh, and really excavated for us uh, High and his career. And that's Anne McMullen, who was the curator and head of collections research and documentation at the NMAI in Washington. So we're going to get a little clips of her, clip of her enormous knowledge of High this afternoon uh, with her talk, A New Dream Museum. Um, you'll recognize some things that I say because Stephen and James have already said them, but I'll say them too, because we all read the same things. So as part of our look back at the origins of the Museum of the American Indian, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts about George Gustav High and his work. About 10 years ago, I began to look at how the collections that are now part of the National Museum of the American Indian, or NMAI as we say, were formed by George High and those who followed him at the Museum of the American Indian. I read what had been written about George High and, with very few exceptions, High was described as an impassioned or obsessive collector of American Indian materials, or perhaps even as some kind of a nut with a mysterious, unexplained need to acquire native objects. I also listened to what my colleagues at NMAI said about High in explaining the origins of the collections to members of the public and to one another, NMAI staff described High as a very large man who loved cigars, who was obsessed with Indians, only interested in amassing a huge collection, who cared nothing for documentation, who married his first wife and spent all her money on his collection, and divorced her because she didn't support his collecting habits, and then married his second wife and did the same. <laughs> that he created the Museum of the American Indian simply to avoid paying taxes, and that he died penniless. Clearly, all of these things strung together make for a rather ridiculous portrait. But those are direct quotes that I received from NMAI staff in 2009 when I asked what they knew about George High and what they conveyed to the public about him and about the origins of the NMAI collections. And without beating around the bush, I'll tell you right now that the only two st true statements in that strange caricature were that George High was a big man and that he was very fond of cigars. <laughs> so if almost all of this is bunk, you might wonder how such a mythology surrounds George High and how it gets repeated by museum staff and by almost everyone else who's written about George High since his death in 1957. Elsewhere, I've suggested that within the context of NMAI's mission and work, George High really can't be honored to any great extent because there's no way to forget that he was somehow responsible for having removed so many objects from native hands and archaeological sites and for sequestering them in a little town called New York City, which is pretty far from where most of those objects started out. And to a very large extent, High himself is considered personally responsible for all of this. Despite the fact that we're all here today to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Museum of the American Indian, the museum and its work is often minimized or even forgotten. When I asked NMAI staff about George High in 2009, I found that some assumed that NMAI was founded on a huge private collection that the High family had simply handed over to the Smithsonian in 1989. In their minds, no other museum of the American Indian had ever existed. 
And even for those who acknowledge the original museum as part of NMAI's history, what NMAI inherited is simply George High's collection and not the broader legacy of the original museum that functioned for more than 70 years. Because the original museum tends to disappear, George High's collection becomes fetishized. And lest you think I'm exaggerating, please note this ad for NMAI's gala celebration earlier this year. And ironically, the moccasin shown here came to the museum in 1961 after High's death. Over decades, many have pondered High's motivations and almost all have suggested that his goal in life was to amass a huge collection. Some have also characterized the collections as indiscriminate, meaning they span everything from traditional objects of surpassing beauty to everyday detritus and everything in between, which suggests that High didn't care what he acquired as long as it added to the overall total. My difficulty is that characterizations like this make development of the collection seem random. At the same time, suggesting that High's goal was to amass a huge collection identifies his motives by matching them with his results, rather than understanding the goals that he set for himself and how he carried them out. However, comments made by American Museum of Natural History archaeologist Junius Byrd, who is certainly one of High's biggest critics, include an interesting contradiction. In 1960, Byrd stated, I doubt High's goal was anything more than to own the biggest damn hobby collection in the world. At the same time, Byrd grudgingly admitted that High was, quote, fortified by sufficient monomania to build up a superlative disciplined collection, unquote. Byrd saw the collection as disciplined rather than random, and, that, and it's that definitive intellectual basis for the collections that's worth our attention. Simultaneously, we should start to think about what lies behind the caricature of George High that I outlined above. If we buy into that caricature and all the falsehoods it includes, what gets left out of the history that we should be trying to tell about what High did and why? To begin to get at this, we need to look at George High not as an individual collector, but instead as a museum builder and try to fathom that his agenda and how he carried it out. First, we need to acknowledge the Museum of the American Indian's professional operations and the magnitude of its work, especially during its heyday between 1916 and 1928. Like other sizable museums of the same period, the Museum of the American Indian was overseen by a board of trustees, published annual operations and financial reports, had its own publication series, and maintained a professional research staff and a support staff for museum operations. Research and collecting was so strongly supported that in 1920, the museum's professional staff of 10 was larger than the anthropology staffs of other big name institutions, including the American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum of Natural History, and the federally funded Bureau of American Ethnology. Like the Bureau of American Ethnology, the museum also supported and published the work of many independent field workers. I also think that we need to refocus our attention on George High himself. When we talk about the founder of the Museum of the American Indian, you probably think, think of High as she, he's shown here in his official a portrait from 1938. He's portrayed as a big, successful man and a man of wealth and appetites. But we should ask ourselves, was it really this man who was there in the beginning? My answer would be not really. Instead, it's time we started thinking about this serious looking young man as the one who started it all. Because in 1904, when he's just 30 years old, George High first began talking about founding a museum. So who is this young man and how did he develop the amb such an ambition at such an early age? And furthermore, how did he develop the skills needed to become director of a successful professionalized museum by 1916? Um, as you've probably heard before, George Gustav High was born in 1874 to Carl, Carl Friedrich Gustav High, a German immigrant, and Marie Antoinette Lawrence High, whose family were long-term New Yorkers. His father, Gustav High, made his money in oil, and George High's upbringing was considered privileged. Young George attended local schools and lived at home and graduated from Columbia School of Mines in 1896 with a degree in electrical engineering. In 1897, the engineering firm he worked for 
sent him to Arizona, where he purchased his first Indian objects from Navajo workmen that he met there. This was both the start of High's collection and his interest in American Indians. On his return to New York, he began an intensive course of reading on Indians. After several years working as an engineer, George High and others formed the investment firm of Battles, High, and Harrison in 1901. High also maintained other business interests. In 1902 and 1903, he bought properties on West 45th Street and built the Hudson Theater at a cost of a quarter million dollars, and then he leased it to a theatrical producer. Shortly thereafter, he married Blanche Agnes Williams, whose father was a mining engineer. Very little is known about High's collecting during, before this point, but after the theater opened, he began to purchase larger collections. Stopping by the American Museum of Natural History in June 1904, High met staff member George Hubbard Pepper, who we've heard about, who provided introductions to colleagues at the Harvard Peabody Museum and the Bureau of American Ethnology. Pepper also helped High purchase the, the accumulated publications of those institutions. That year, High became a member of the American Anthropological Association and, with Pepper's help, purchased major collections of Southwestern archaeology. Installing them in a museum room in his, oops, sorry, there's George Pepper, um, a museum room in his Madison Avenue apartment. We have no idea what this museum looked like, but it might have been a simpler version of this installation from Joseph Kepler's home. In 1904, High accompanied Kepler on a trip to Seneca reservations in western New York. High said of these experiences, I learned more about real Indians in those few days than from reading books for many months. Pardon me, I'm having trouble with this thing. High continued his anthropological studies and became acquainted with other staff at the American Museum of Natural History, including Franz Boas and Marshall Seville. Boas helped High purchase Northwest Coast objects and later solicited High's support for anthropological studies at Columbia. Over the next several years, George Pepper and Marshall Seville mentored High in developing his collections as well as in his understanding of anthropology and archaeology. As you can tell from the pace of these events, both High's collection and his ideas developed rapidly. And by December 1905, he'd formulated the idea for an anthropology museum with separate exhibition and study facilities. And he discussed it with archaeologist Adolf Bandelier. In proposing this two-part scheme, High probably drew on the writings of Smithsonian's George Brown Good who had articulated the discrete purposes of, pu of public exhibits versus museums of research with immense study collections. Um, at this point, High's partner in his museum idea was Benjamin Talbot Babbitt Hyde, a wealthy young man who'd sponsored excavations at Chaco Canyon and deposited his collections at the American Museum of Natural History. In December 1905, they met with Archer Huntington, a noted supporter of the American Museum, who'd founded the Hispanic Society of America in 1904 and had plans for a building for it at 155th and Broadway. Together, George High and Talbot Hyde proposed the establishment of an independent anthropology museum, which they felt was justified by the American Museum's lack of activity in that area, and perhaps specifically in American archaeology which had emerged as George High's prime focus. Huntington responded by saying that he couldn't support the idea of two New York museums covering the same ground. Despite this setback, High moved forward <coughs> with building collections for his planned museum. Starting in 1906, he and his mother sponsored expeditions to Latin America and the Caribbean, and High rented work and storage spaces on West 34th Street and in the Nabe building at 5th, and 30, 5th Avenue and 39th. Through a purchase of duplicate collections in 1907, High also began a relationship with the University of Pennsylvania Museum, then of course called the Free Museum, and its curator, George Byron Gordon. Increasingly, High focused on his, his attention and his resources on his planned museum. In 1908, he sold the Hudson Theater for $700,000, and that's more than $18 million in today's terms and he moved his collection to two floors of a building at 10 East 33rd Street, a location which came to be called the High Museum. The museum staff included Frank Utley, who'd been employed by High since 1904, and anthropologist Mark Raymond Harrington. George Pepper and Marshall Seville were closely associated with the High Museum as advisors. <clears throat> 
Although the rented spaces on East 33rd were called a museum, visitors could see the collections only by appointment. Nonetheless, High and the collections were very visible. And in October 1908, High agreed to lend his North American collections to the University of Pennsylvania's University Museum. Simultaneously, High was elected to their board of managers and served as a vice president of the museum and head of the American section. Others have suggested that these were honorary titles, but extant correspondence shows that High may have spent part of each week in Philadelphia and that he played an active role in the University Museum's operations, including supporting the salaries of George Pepper, Mark Carrington, and William C. Orchard. As head of the American section, High controlled field work and collections expeditions, excuse me, collections expenditures, and made staffing and administrative decisions. High's collections were installed in three galleries at the University Museum by February 1910. High's relationship with the University Museum is usually explained as a way to find space for his burgeoning collections. But I strongly suspect that High's work at Penn also gave him what he couldn't learn in any other way, which was experience in everyday museum operations, including exhibitions, visitation, fundraising, publications, and the role of museum boards. Through his years in engineering, business, and construction projects, High already had an impressive skill set. But without these years at Penn, it's unlikely that he could have convinced anyone to support him in his dream of founding an anthropology museum. And High definitely did need others' support. Although he was wealthy, building a museum was beyond his means. Early on, he'd solicited support from Archer Huntington, who'd also dreamed of founding a museum and had made it happen. But unlike High, Archer Huntington was part of New York's established culture of philanthropy, where wealthy families supported museums, arts institutions, and social welfare causes. Although George High's mother made small contributions to local hospitals, her greatest efforts supported High's <coughs> archaeological expeditions to Latin America. We have a sense of High's finances and how little he had available at this point, because Blanche High brought divorce proceedings against him in 1913, citing him for adultery and demanding $78,000 a year in alimony and child support. She maintained that his net worth was $2.5 million and that his annual income was $140,000. She also noted that he'd spent more establishing his private museum of Indian antiquities than she asked for their children's educations. High countered by showing that his total net worth was only $392,000 with an annual income of $30,000. He also suggested that Blanche's extravagances were the source of his considerable financial difficulties. Ultimately, Blanche was awarded far less than she had requested, but this was a setback for High's museum plan, not only due to its, effect, its effects on his finances, but also to his dignity and his reputation. Everything surrounding the divorce was highly publicized, just like this article, including his adultery. And his business correspondence shows his embarrassment that his personal affairs achieved such notoriety. Once the divorce was final, High and his mother left for Europe and remained there for several months. On his return, High continued his work at Penn with renewed attention and may even have accelerated his work building his own collection. By 1912, the High Museum staff included archaeologist Marshall Seville and Theodore Dubois, and High also funded the work of Mark Raymond Harrington and others through the University Museum. High withdrew entirely from his brokerage practice in 1914, and by this time, two individuals important to the future Museum of the American Indian had entered the picture, Harmon Hendricks and Mrs. Thea Page. Hendricks and his family were in metals and manufacturing and had long-standing connections with the highs. Thea Page was a divorcee living in New York and had her own Indian collection. This photo of a staff dinner at the High Museum suggests that George and Thea knew one another before his divorce, or at least before his mother's death in February 1915. George High is said to have inherited an estimated $10 million from his mother, which certainly set the stage for the creation of the museum he dreamed of for more than 10 years. Over the next year, the staff High had supported at Penn, Mark Raymond Harrington, William C. Orchard, and George Pepper, resigned their positions and joined the High Museum staff. In July 1915, George and Thea were married in Atlanta and spent their honeymoon at George's Nakuchi Mound excavations, which he funded jointly with the Bureau of American Ethnology. 
By November 1915, Franz Boas, then in Columbia's anthropology department, had heard about Hyde's plans to create an American Indian Museum, and he tried to convince Hyde to abandon the idea. Hyde's response, which Stephen has given us before, provides the clearest extant record of Hyde's purpose in creating the museum. He wrote, when I started my collections, I was in business downtown, and when I endeavored in my leisure hours to find some place where I could be directed in the science I wished to take up, I found that there was no place in the city where a man could go and get elementary training unless he entered a regular college course. I feel that there are many men in New York placed as I was, therefore an institution that is open to them in the evening where they can be taught at least the rudiments of anthropology is a necessity. This shows that a key element of Hyde's museum idea was indeed adult education and anthropology, which for him entailed direct examination and study of collections. The idea that objects could be read by those who closely examine them is what Stephen Kahn has called an object-based epistemology. And it was in this 19th century tradition that High had pursued his own studies for years. As High wrote to his friend Joseph Kepler in 1948, they are not alone objects to me, but sources of vistas and dreams of their makers and owners. Whether utilitarian or ceremonial, I try to feel why and how the owner felt regarding them. While the idea that objects could speak for themselves would soon become passe, it was part of the philosophical basis for High's museum idea. By May 1916, everything finally came together. High executed the trust agreement to create the Museum of the American Indian, deeded his entire collection of 180,000 objects to it, and provided an endowment of $400,000. A week later, Archer Huntington donated a building site at 155th and Broadway in the Audubon Terrace complex of cultural organizations that he supported. High and James Bishop Ford of the U.S. Rubber Company each pledged $100,000 toward the building's construction costs, which were estimated at a quarter of a million dollars. For the first board of trustees included High, Archer Huntington, James B. Ford, Harmon Hendricks, and others who supplied both the funds and the business acumen to make the museum a reality. The 1916 trust agreement created a museum for the collection, preservation, study, and exhibition of all things connected with the anthropology of the aboriginal people of the North, Central, and South Americas and containing objects of artistic, historic, literary, and scientific interest. In articulating the museum's mission, George Pepper and others emphasized systematic collecting and scholarly purpose, to gather and preserve for students everything useful in illustrating and elucidating the anthropology of the aborigines of the Western Hemisphere, and to disseminate by means of its publications the knowledge thereby gained. By focusing on the Americas and emphasizing archaeology and the acquisition of older material, including organic items preserved in caves and protected sites, High and the Museum sought to reinvigorate public and scholarly interest in the American past rather than newly discovered European and Middle Eastern sites. Although the museum was essentially finished by 1917, parts of it were turned over to the U.S. State Department during World War I, and the public opening was delayed until 1922. In the meantime, the museum's research and expeditions continued. High's plans for the museum had always included a separate study facility. And as early as May 1917, High, Huntington, and Ford had purchased a sizable tract of land several blocks from the museum. There they established the Department of Physical Anthropology and rented out the other houses. But within 10 years, work by the museum staff had tripled the size of the collection deeded by High in 1916. And ultimately, High's imagined study facility, called the Museum Annex, was built in the Bronx in 1926, complete with native gardens designed by Thea High. By 1930, the museum's extensive library, rare books, and manuscript collections also needed more space and were moved to the Huntington Free Library in the Bronx. Over the course of several years, High built the museum's professional staff, drawing Frederick Webb Hodge from the Bureau of American Ethnology and recruiting outstanding young scholars, including Samuel K. Lothrop, Donald Kadzow, Allenson Skinner, Melvin Gilmore, and Arthur Woodward. Looking back on this period, Lothrop remarked, we were all of us, I think, drawn towards High by the prospect of a new dream museum. Hard work demanded, technical skill expected, 
and publication assured. Without the teaching responsibilities of their university colleagues, the staff were full-time researchers who built many of the collections we know today and produced an astounding body of work. Above all, they knew they worked for a museum devoted to research and scholarship, not a private collector. These halcyon days could not last forever. With the deaths of benefactors James B. Ford and Harmon Hendricks in 1928, High had to dismiss his professional staff. While conditions improved somewhat during the 1930s, the museum's program would never be the same. Thea High's death in 1935 further deprived High of the unconditional support he'd relied on during their 20-year marriage. Despite this, High continued to expand the depth and breadth of the archaeological and ethnographic collections when he could. At his death in 1957, the museum's collections numbered over 700,000 items, plus historical photographs and archival materials. His will included a $1 million bequest to the museum to continue its work. Ultimately, the question we might ask is whether High fulfilled his original vision of what the Museum of the American Indian could and should be. I suspect that the museum of the 1920s was what he had in mind all along. But without the tremendous support the museum had in its early decades, High could not rebuild his professional staff or reestablish the museum as a research powerhouse. In the end, what remained was the museum's collections. And even at the end of his life, High continued to try to build and refine the collections, although this sometimes took the form of exchanges or sales of objects to provide funds for new acquisitions. To me, this suggests that he never forgot the big idea that had driven the museum's development for more than 50 years, which was, as George Pepper put it in 1916, the work of collecting and preserving for future study the aesthetic, utilitarian, and ceremonial objects of the tribes of North, South, and Central America and the West Indies. I think we can say with some certainty that if he did nothing else in his lifetime, George Hive certainly did fulfill that dream. Thank you.